Let's see what Vlad cooked up for us today. <laughs> I'm game for anything. Functors, monads, etc. in Scout. By Vlad. So let's begin by taking a look at something that's called a parameterized type. So a parameterized type is also called a type constructor. And it's called a type constructor, constructor because it's not actually a type. It's something you have to feed types to in order to construct a type. It's the same as a data constructor. Everyone's heard that, right? Like a constructor in Java or Scala or like a case class constructor. What do you feed to a case class? You feed it values and you get back a value after you've, after you've fed it all the things that it requires. So that's a data constructor. And a type constructor, otherwise known as a parameterized type, <coughs> is um, a similar thing. You feed it types and it returns a type. So let's take a look at uh, a few examples here, such as type A. Type A, in this example, A is a type constructor. And how many parameters does it take? One. Exactly. And if you feed A one type parameter, what will you get back? A type. A type. That's exactly correct. So how about type C? How many type parameters does that one have? Two type, two type parameters. And thus, you're going to have to feed it two types in order to get back a type. Now, let's take another look at type constructors. Uh, this time, a little fancier. Trait F that's parameterized by G, which is parameterized by something. What is the meaning of that? Well. That is the equivalent of a higher order function, but in types. Because what is this? Think of, think of these things as functions. If A is a function that you feed a type B and it's going to give you a type, then what does that make G? G is a function you feed a type to get back a type. So what does that make F? Well, F is sort of a, a, the type version, the type equivalent of a higher order function. You feed f a type function called g, and, and g takes a type and returns a type. And if you feed f this type constructor g, which takes and returns a type, you get back a type. Does that make sense? Can everyone see the parallel there between that and functions? There, there is exactly a parallel. And the only difference here is that the syntax is different. But there's no <coughs> intrinsic difference. Uh, you can substitute. A different syntax for values and yes. Could you have put a letter in where that underscore is? Um, you could not have put a letter in where the underscore is. Actually, um, technically, you cannot put an underscore in the other examples either because um, those would need an equal sign to actually be like valid Scala. Those will need an equal equal sign. The type syntax in Scala is a type alias, and so you would have to do like type a. The, actually, that could be an abstract type inside a class. I take that back. But in any case, I don't think it should have a letter there. All right, so let's take a look at the most complex example here. And if you get this, you will hopefully get the rest of the presentation. <laughs> I say that without actually knowing what the rest of the presentation is. <laughs> OK, so what is this h thing? Well, think of it as uh, a function, right? It's a function that takes three parameters. And the first parameter is a type. And uh, the second parameter is a type constructor that takes a type. So think of that as a function of, of one type that, that you pass a type to and you get back a type. And then it takes k, which is another type. So you, you feed this thing three things, um, two of which are types. And one is a type constructor that takes one parameter. And you get back a type, which is um, which is demonstrated down below. So how can we actually use this type constructor? Well, again, we want to we create, actually, this is a class. So not only is it a type, but we can create things that have this shape. And so we're going to do that in, in the bottom example by doing new h. And we're going to feed it a type for the first one, string, a type constructor for the second one. And actually, the syntax is, is I'm, I'm not sure if this is 
Yeah, the, this is not valid, Scala. This is not. <laughs> uh, delete the double. So what you would have to do is um, delete everything in the square brackets, and then it would become valid. Because remember, uh, what is list of double? What is list of double? Like list square bracket double, what is that thing? It is a type, and it's not a type constructor. You've already fed your double parameter to it to get back the list of double type. So, and, and that's not what it is, is, it is expecting. The compiler is expecting J to be a type constructor. So this would, in fact, give you a, a type error. But if you pass just list to it, what is list? Type, type constructor. Yes, and that's exactly what it's expecting. So, I think with uh, that background, it's time to introduce a functor. So a functor is a type um, a, a type constructor that accepts another type. And it, it happens to be a, a, it happens to have a particular function called map to find on it, which observes a couple of laws. So before we dig into what all that means, let's just go ahead and take uh, a look at the, uh, the laws. The laws are as follows. If you take, um, or look at this map function for a second. So uh, it takes a function from x to y and returns an f of y. So one of the laws says, well, if you have two functions and one is f and one is g, and you can imagine like x to y and y to z, then if you compose those functions together, so you get an x to z, I mean, you can, you can compose those functions in Scala with and then, so you compose those functions together so you get an x to z, um, and then take that x to z function and feed it to the map function to get back your new f of z, then that should be exactly equivalent to first calling the map function with f, and then calling it, uh, or, or first calling the map function with f, and then calling, and then, yeah. <laughs> I thought I was going somewhere with that. What the heck is, is that? Oh, uh, no, no. Okay, so, so that second and there shouldn't, shouldn't really be there. What we want to do is we want to map first by f, and then we want to take that and feed it and map by, by g. So that should not be an and then, it, it should be like more nested maps. So just think of that as like nested maps. So if we take and we feed a, and, and let's, let's give a concrete example here. So let's say we have a, a function which takes an integer and prints out its string value. And then we have a function which takes a string value and prints out its length. So what does this functor law say to us? It says for a thing to be a functor, it must observe the following property, that if we map over it with f compose g, or f and then the g in, in, in this case, then we should get back the same thing as mapping over it first with f and then mapping over it later with g. So let's say we have a list is an example of a functor, as I'll talk about soon. Let's say we have an, uh, a list of uh, strings, and we call our first thing, or our list of integers, and first we map that to a list, list of strings, which represent the like pretty printed, you know, integer. You, you convert the uh, the integer to a, its string representation, and and then after that we call map again on the list, and we get back a list of the lengths, the number of digits in those in those strings. Uh, for list to actually be a functor, that should be exactly equivalent as taking that first function which converts it into to its string representation and composing that with the function that converts from the string representation to the number of characters in that string to get a new function and taking this function and mapping a single time over the elements of the integer list. And in fact, you can verify that list does satisfy that property. And list is not the only thing to satisfy that property. There are lots and lots of things out there that satisfy that law. 
The other thing that uh, the other law a functor has to, or a thing has to observe for it to be a functor is the identity law. And this one is a lot easier to think about. Uh, the identity law just says that if you, have a, um, if you have a list of integers and you map it by feeding it the identity function, then that should be exactly equivalent to, I'm trying to decipher this notation here. It is identity and identity functor for f. So that's the same as doing nothing, basically. So mapping over a functor with the identity function should leave that unchanged. And what happens when you take a list and you map over it with a function that's going to return whatever you pass into it? No, this is this the is. identity map with respect to the type X. Yeah, so, so um, does that sort of make sense? In, in some sense, this, this law, this, these functor laws, say that basically if F represents some structure, something that has some sort of shape, then mapping, that map function needs to not change its shape. And for a list, it's pretty obvious what that means, right? It's, Starts with n elements and it ends with n elements. That's that's. Uh, why why would you do that? Why would you map an entity over a list? Okay, yeah, it's that's the exact same list. Uh, that's true. You would never ever ever do that. But it's important to be able to precisely define what a functor is. So when you're looking to something, you can say, is this a functor? Is it not a functor? And that property there is is very very useful because. Um, once you have that property, a shape-preserving property, then um, you know it's not going to alter the structure. For example, if someone defined a functor for a list, one way of satisfying um, the first property would be to, for map, uh, the map function defined on list, to always return nil. Can you see why it would satisfy the first property? Uh, if map always returns nil, well, nil is equal to nil. <coughs> So it, it's great. I mean, it satisfies the first property, but it does so in a degenerate way. And the, the second property basically keeps you honest and says, now you can't do that, otherwise it's not a functor. So if you do have those two laws, then your type constructor, which accepts one type and, and then returns a type, is, is in fact a functor. So hopefully, yeah, we'll, we'll take a, a look at some examples now. So let's take a look at set. And set has a map function, but it's not a functor, is it? It's not a functor because mapping can change the shape of the thing. So if we take, remember sets can't contain duplicates. So if you map all the things in a set to uh, something like a constant, for example, or just things that in which you would have duplicates, then the shape of that thing, the shape of the set will be changed. You're not going to have the same number of elements. You're going to have fewer elements in the map set than you did in the original set. So even though set has a functor, or a set has a map function, Set does not satisfy the functor law. Set is not a functor. And what that means, that's actually, anyone who's used map or set in earnest has probably run into a case where you're like, what happened to this information? You know, I, I've, I've used, uh, I've used um, set in many cases where I've been like mapping stuff along, or no, I've, I've more often used maps. Like I've used maps and I've mapped over the keys and then, you know, I, I end up doing something crazy, and I end up with a, a map that, or a set that contains a fraction of the elements I started with, and I'm like, how did this happen? And I, I blame the CPU, of course, and then I blame the compiler, and then I blame the JVM, and finally I just accept I made a mistake somewhere. And it's because, again, that, that thing, it, it, it's not information preserving, it's, uh, it's shape altering. It's going gonna, it's gonna to not just do the mapping and keep the structure the same, but then you can think of a set as 
okay, after we've done that map, we're gonna collapse out all the duplicate elements and possibly collapse everything down to a set of one in, in the worst possible degenerate case. So which property fails? It is, um, let's see. So actually both properties fail. Both properties could fail uh, for some definition because you could map, oh no, that's not true because the functions are, are deterministic. So only the second, only the second property, no. Uh, The first property fails, right? Yes. Mapping to F can be, uh, can be degenerative, and the mapping back to G isn't going to re explode it into its original set. But that's, just, that, that's already true of uh, G and then F, or F and then G. So, that, that's correct, but this is exposed. Here, actually. Well, one of them is broken. One or both. <laughs> TBD. I mean, I, I don't have a, I don't have an example um, in mind here. It's like if things can compare equal but not be equal. Like, right. Well, it, with equals, but it actually I'm I'm sure it's I'm sure it's the first one. I just can't think of a concrete example. So the example on the, the first rule, the example on the left, map F and then G would take a one and turn it into A, and then take A, turn it back into A1, right? Or take an integer, turn it into a string, and string back to an integer. Maintain, so, so F and then G uh, is, what, what I see is the equivalent of identity F, uh, which is not the same as map F and then map G, because after you do the first map, it's degenerative. And once, and once you're done with that first step, you can't read, you can't go back up to uh, a full collection. But if f is not one to one, then it yeah. can't have an inverse yeah. So, so you're simply observing that a function which does some collapsing can't be inverted. That's a general fact of mathematics. Yeah. So, um, so I, I'm not, I'm not actually certain. I don't have, I don't have an example here, but I'm, I'm certain that set violates the functor laws. All right, um, and, and that it is because of the elimination of duplicates and the change in, in the structure of the set, even though I, I, can't, I can't figure out exactly the connection there. I blame three hours of sleep and not actually supposed to be doing this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's quickly move on. Um, composition of two functors is a functor. What does that even mean? Well, it means that if we have, for example, uh, a list and like an option, an option in Scala is a functor. It observes the laws, which it preserves the, the shape of, of the thing being mapped. And uh, if we have a, a list of options, we can actually write a functor instance for that because both list and option are functors. And, and you don't have to really write it yourself, but you, you could write it if you wanted to. And in fact, something more generally holds, something more generally holds, which is that if you have uh, two functors, uh, any two functors at all, if both of them satisfy the functor laws, then you can write uh, that map function uh, for the com composition of those two things, for the nesting of those two things, if that makes sense. And, and that's, it, it's, it's nice, and, and wh where that helps you is, say you do have something like a, a, a map of strings to lists of options of doubles. Like if you want to map those doubles, nasty, <laughs> because you have to like map all this crap. But if you can just take the functors, the defined functors for those things, and compose them together, then you can just compose the, the functor for the map with the functor for the list with the functor for option and get a new functor. And with that new functor, you can simply call map and it's gonna map the thing that's on the inside. So that's a, that's a cool and very useful property that's, it, when, when you come to a point in writing Scala code where you were like map underscore map underscore map underscore map, you know you've reached the point where you need functor composition in order to take care of some of that boilerplate. String the functors together and, and just map the, the single thing, which is the composition of all these things. 
So uh, not everything is a functor. Um, let's take that thing there. Yes, so e, e of x is equal to x to x. So that's a function from x to x. And uh, can, can we define map? No, you can't define map. And the reason there is um, uh, what's, what's called a, uh, a, a functor in um, functional programming. It's actually an endofunctor in um, category theory, or it's a, it's a covariant endofunctor in cat category theory. And uh, what that means is basically the type parameter for the functor has to occur in uh, what scholar would call covariant position, which means it has to be something you get out rather than you put in. Contravariants are things you stuff in. Covariants are things you get out. Um, so what that means is um, in something like E of x, x has to be something you get out of the expression on the right-hand side. But in this example, it's something that you put in and it's something you get out. So it appears in both contravariant and covariant position. And any time that uh, you run into that nasty state of affairs, uh, the thing you end up with is not a covariant endofunctor. In fact, it's a, it's a different type. It's called an exponential functor. And in order, you can't actually implement map for that. You have to implement a different version of map, which says I can map, I can map a, if I'm, if I'm mapping to a y, for example, then I'm going to have to provide two functions, a g function to go from a y to an x, and an f function to go from an x to a y. And if I can provide both those two things, then I can map the, the uh, exponential functor of x into an exponential functor of y. But all that to say is just because it is a type constructor that accepts one type doesn't mean it's a functor. And as I tried to show and failed with, with set, <laughs> set is not a functor. And not just set, but like lots of other things that have that same structure are not functors. Covariance. OK, so uh, yeah, we're going to skip that. <laughs> <laughs> I already talked enough about covariance, I think. I don't want to talk about Scott's covariance. So let's uh, skip that too. That's an example. This is a for loop. And <laughs> I don't know, it looks pretty cool to me. You should do all the presentations for the rest of the day. <laughs> We're going to take enough crap for this one. Well, this. Matthew was talking about the syntactic sugar for math and flat math and the poor comprehension for Scala. That's all it looks like he's trying to demonstrate. Right, except this is, this is equivalent to a flat map followed by a flat map followed by a map. Yeah, it figures out which one you need for you. Yeah, so, so Scala's four loops actually compile down to not just this map on a functor, but a functor is one of, of several things and uh, several abstractions that are super common in functional programming. Uh, there are steps beyond func functor. So functor is a very generic thing. Lots of things are functors. But there are things that have more structure than a functor and that, that uh, allow you to do more specific things. Um, and uh, the next, or one of the next steps, in um, that sort of level of how, uh, how much power you get out of a thing is called a monad. And a monad is something that you're going to hear about a lot if you, if you get into functional programming. And a monad is something that not only has that map function, it has to have a map function, so all monads are functors. Um, it has to have a map function, but it also has to have two other functions that satisfy their own laws. One is called flat map in Scala, and the other one is called uh, has no name in, in the Scala collections, but it's basically the uh, constructor for like a list, for example. The, the, uh, it, this is called pure point sometimes, but that operation says you can take an A and you can lift it up into an F of A. And if you can, if you can do that, 
and you can flat map it, and you can map it, and they satisfy all these laws, then that thing is a monad. And uh, that's all there is to monads. Monads are type constructors of one parameter that have map, flat map, and this like point, point operation to, to lift an A into an F of A um, that satisfy the laws. And, um, and, and list satisfies those laws. Option satisfies those laws. Effects satisfy those laws. Asynchronous programming satisfy those laws. There's so many things that satisfy those laws that that abstraction of a monad and, and a functor and then in between those two there's something called apply and applicative that they're super useful. They're useful for all these different things and, and thus they represent sort of core patterns of uh, functional programming. So that's really all we have time for. So I'm gonna uh, cut it off there and encourage you to <laughs> Go to uh, another talk tomorrow um, called uh, uh, Monstrous Names, the Beginner's Bestiary, that one, Monstrous Names Aren't Scary, something like that, where you're going to run into some of these abstractions again and, and by someone who's, who's actually uh, like prepared to do them. So please go to that talk and thank you for coming to this one.